Hello and welcome to the Catonia live stream, which is now a, well, it's not now permanently a Wednesday live stream, but right now I am doing it on Wednesday. Uh, Monday ended up being a day off for me. Um, so, and honestly, I didn't repost about this this morning, so I don't know how many people are going to be joining me live. Maybe some people will. Um, oh, and Alex is joining me live. <laughs> I was just saying, I wasn't sure how many people were going to join me live today. Because um, I normally I will post something on the day saying, hey, live stream today. But um, I posted it Monday. And so, uh, and, and Sam, hello. Um, welcome, you guys. Um, yeah, so so this is my, my noon live stream. And for you guys, since, since the two of you are normally on my other live stream on my other channel, um, there's going to be some of this at the end that might feel a little repetitive to you. So just just so you know. But, uh, but I do want to start by talking a little bit about um, Catonia updates and, and what's going on with Catonia because I've been, um, I can say that my energy has been spread quite thin. Hi, I've caught up on my YouTube channel, so happy you're on. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, okay, cool. And um, yeah, I had uh, actually, thank you for saying that because what you reminded me is one of the first things I have to do and it's on my list for this afternoon is to get the rest of the morning coffee stuff uploaded to YouTube. And I also need to, I didn't post last week's Catonia live stream. Normally I'll, the next day I'll go and I'll post it to um, the uh, to the Catonia channel, but I completely got sidetracked. Well, it was the first week that we were doing um, the Institute for the Study of Feminine Myth so I did not actually, you know, I think my, my energy was all focused on that and I did not think about posting uh, the, the live stream. So I'm going to try to catch up with all of that stuff today. Uh, those of you who are in the Institute for the Study of Feminine Myth, I also want to get the form together for the project. Now, it's, it's a bit early to talk about it, but, I, but for people who might, you know, as soon as they, they start to formulate an idea of what they want, I want the form to just be there and available for when the, the students who are enrolled for the full uh, the full term, uh, they can they can actually submit that. So the sooner that they have that together, the sooner we could match them up with somebody. Um, now this week we are actually tonight is going to be the um, seminar with Dr. Joanna Madlock. We did the lecture on Baba Yaga last week. I do want to mention for anybody who ends up watching you on on a catch up or even on now that if people want to go back and, uh, and are not part of the regular term but want to get recordings of lectures afterwards, uh, I do actually have a form for those. I'm kind of doing $65 per lecture. And if people want to do to audit both the lecture and the seminar, people can, you know, but not take the whole term, people can do that as well. Uh, and that's usually, basically it's coming out to like $60 a week. It's actually cheaper for people who are enrolled for the full semester. Um, it's actually about half of that. Um, because because they're also paying for the project and everything else that goes along with it. So um, yeah, so, ba so basically we are you know, we're moving in. We're going to be moving into week two out of an eight week um, you know lecture slash seminar uh, set. Um, now um, the next person after Joanna next week is going to be next Thursday. Dr. Kate Kinsbury is going to be on uh, giving her presentation and I will probably be doing her seminar the week after. She is preparing to go to a conference in Mexico, so it's a rather tight time crunch. Uh, she did, she had been looking to potentially do it when she got back. Uh, she couldn't, you know, but she wasn't able, she couldn't do it in the time frame that I was in and Max wasn't able to switch with her. So, um, so probably, and I don't know, I just, I imagine she's going to be just as busy when she gets back as well. So I just told her, why don't we just do it that, that she does the lecture piece and that I'll do the seminar piece. So uh, that's how that's going to go for the next two. Uh, but in any case, we're recording all of this. I'm actually keeping it um, on a private channel and it will be shared with people who, you know, who pay to, to see it. And because I, I want to put it in a place where it's... Um, where, where it's readily accessible. Where I have it now, I might end up moving it, but I'm, I'm working that out anyway. I won't get into all the details of that right now. Um, and I've also been doing some writing in between, and because it's autumn, I really, really want to be sitting outside reading. You see the pile that I have over here of books that I am that I was going through last night. Um, I keep seeing reviews. I'm like in the mood for some more Shirley Jackson. I'm reading The King in Yellow right now. And then I found a whole bunch of other collections that I had bought while I was in, both in, um, when I was down in uh, Plymouth 
and so where I had been. Yeah, because I feel like I'd gone to the bookstores in the center of town. I love, one thing I love about England is that every major town seems to have, has, has a bookstore somewhere. There's a Blackwell's or there's a, um, that's usually who it is. It's usually Blackwell's. I mean, there is Waterstones and um, W.H. Smith, which tend to be a little more, you know, mass market, I guess. But, um, but I tend to find things. I, I mean, I always, I always find myself popping into a bookstore or wherever I am. So I always, and I always tell myself I'm not buying anything this time. I'm just here to read, to research and write. And I always come home with an armload of books. So it's, it's almost impossible for me to stay out of bookstores when I'm traveling abroad. But anyway, I found a whole bunch of these short story collections and I'm like, oh, I really want to sit down. And some of them are rereads and others I may have only scratched the surface of and not really gotten into again. And of course, doing my own writing, a lot of this is an inspiration for my own writing too. Not not that I want to, you know, not an inspiration in the sense of copying the ideas of the authors, but sometimes even the writing style. I'm thinking, oh, that's really great. I love the way that they, they do their description, or I like the way that they approach this. So you're not writing the same thing, but that might be an approach you think about when you're creating narrative. You know, how, how descriptive do you want it to be? And what would be the thing? I just often feel that when I'm trying to write, like right now, when I'm trying to write things that are in England, I'm like, it would be really useful for me to be there, to be able to see it and describe it as I see it, you know? But uh, at the moment, that's uh, that's not the, the situation that I'm in. Um, but uh, who knows, hopefully by the end of the year, I'll be able to take like another retreat. I, I tend to like to go to England on the off season anyway. I don't necessarily want to go when everybody's there doing the tourist thing. Um, though I don't spend a whole lot of time in places like London. I mean, I do go to London and I do have friends and things that I visit there, but I don't, um, I don't necessarily spend all my time there. It's very expensive. And, um, you know, and again, like if I'm going to get my hair done or whatever, I, I don't, I don't like to, um, you know, like I said, I might, I might be there for like two or three days and see some friends, but I prefer to be out in the countryside somewhere. Uh, that is my, uh, my preference. I prefer the South. The Southwest is my favorite place, but, um, oh, there's places in the, there's places all over the UK that I like, I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but I, I, I just love the whole, um, the whole country. And the last time I was there, I was in Oxford, which, you know, I like Oxford and I have friends there as well. Uh, so, you know, so it was, it was nice. I mean, it's, you know, it was, but I think I would have preferred to be uh, someplace a little, slightly more off the beaten track, but when you, when you're not able to travel that much, like when you don't have a car or when it's, it's not one of those things where you can continually call a taxi and stuff to go places. Sometimes it's just better to be in a city where it's easy for, easy to get around. Um, it was easy. I could walk to the bus on the corner, you know, in Oxford to get into town for anything I needed. Or if I was ambitious, I could have just walked, <laughs> you know, um, depending on the weather, uh, largely. Anyway, I don't mean to divert into that, but writing has been kind of on my on my uh, agenda. Um, not uh, trying to fit that in, trying to fit in time to read. I was just outside cleaning up the first batch of leaves in my yard, and that took me about two hours just to get stuff back into the woods. And um, you know, and I just so I, and I'm coming in, and I'm just tired, and <laughs> I'm just trying to uh, reconnect with things. Um, I also recorded a podcast for my Patreon only subscribers. And this is a podcast on The King in Yellow, actually, um, because there's some interesting themes in there. That is actually a work that is there's it's a collection of short stories and at least one section of short poems. Um, and this is a work by Robert Chambers that is often considered to be a kind of precursor to H.P. Lovecraft and his kind of uh, kind of eldritch horror. Uh, the the King in Yellow being kind of, and, and, his, and this, this kingdom of Carcosa being this kind of, um, it, it ends up being this kind of um, code, as it were, for this, for this kind of um, dreary landscape. The King in Yellow being this, having this pallid mask that really there's nothing behind it. You know, there's that, that kind of a, of a thing. And sometimes I have seen some Lovecraftian writers try to portray the King in Yellow as like being a tentacled creature like Cthulhu or something. And, that's not really what I get out of it. Um, but the, the most the most interesting thing is that the first four stories in The King in Yellow are around this, this it's supposed to be based on, based on a play called The King in Yellow. And this is a play that is, you know, in, in typical Necronomicon fashion, um, in terms of the, the effect of it, uh, you read Act 1 and it's normal, but as soon as you read Act 2, you go mad. Okay, that's the, there's something in it that is so horrible that it, it'll make you go mad. 
So, um, so it's, it's an interesting kind of read, but of course they don't give you the whole play. They just give you certain snippets of dialogue and so forth. And there's a lot that's calls back to Edgar Allan Poe's like Mask of the Red Death. Um, certainly the idea of Carcosa comes from an Ambrose Bierce story. I love Ambrose Bierce. I love his writing. And it's a, an inhabitant of Carcosa was the name of the original story. So there, there's a lot that kind of plays on those things. It also gives a vision of the United States that is really, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit, it's supposed to be like a, almost a utopian vision, but it's very unsettling. And in any case, I, I get into this in the, in the Patreon only podcast. So, um, so people who want to subscribe to Patreon, um, I, I do try to do extra episodes for Patreon subscribers at the $5 level and above. So, um, so that's going to be going on over there. But I think the, the main theme of, of what I was trying to talk about was the fact that everybody says, oh, the first four stories are, are the, the creepy, macabre, horror-type stories. And then the rest of it's just a bunch of weird romance stuff. It doesn't have anything to do with it. And my point is, no, actually, I think all of it does work together. Um, especially if you want to take a look at it from, uh, a, from, from a, a perspective of the masculine-feminine in an archetypal sense. I do think all the stories work together and that there is an underlying um, theme that you can take away. Now, whether, again, whether or not that was what Robert Chambers intended with the work, the author intent is, is just one of those things. I've, I've taken whole classes on author intent and, and how, generally speaking, we consider it to be literature, literature um, and literary criticism that's considered to be kind of fallacious. Like, whatever the intent of the author is, the work itself kind of takes on a life of its own and ends up um, projecting something into into the sphere that we're in. So, um, so yeah, so that's that's something else that um, I'm, I'm trying to work through. And, and I, did, I did record the podcast this morning, and I just have to edit it. I just can't believe I did a live stream this morning. I recorded a podcast, which I still have to edit. And then I have, and then I went outside and cleaned up my yard. And now I'm here doing this. Um, and then I've got I've got a client at four. And then I've got, <laughs> got this at five, you know, it's a busy day today. Um, but, uh, but I'm extremely motivated because it's really, really beautiful out. Um, okay. So the thing that, um, I was going to talk about a bit today, um, is I'm kind of getting back to the theme of Lilith and the theme of fidelity. And while I did talk about this on the morning coffee live stream a couple days ago, I want to think, I'm thinking about this theme a little bit more. And I'm thinking also about it in terms of what we're trying to do with the Institute for the Study of Feminine Myth, because in a certain way, I thought this is actually almost a little bit of a good case study of, because when we say, oh, we're trying to rework narratives for the 21st century, um, well, what does that mean? That just sounds like a lot of buzzwords, you know? It sounds like, you know, oh, we're, we're, we're aiming for a paradigm shift and uh, we're going to do this. You know, it, it all sounds like, you know, some, sometimes it sounds a little like corporate tease, you know, it doesn't. You know, you kind of like, well, how does how does this translate into the real world? And how does thinking about these ideas going to actually make any change in the real world? Because that's certainly a question that people, it's a legitimate question. I mean, you you, you can sit around in, in the bar or you can sit around in a coffee shop or, or whatever, and you can talk ideas till you're blue in the face. But um, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that what we're talking about, um, if, if it doesn't, if it's not, uh, bolstered in some degree by life experience, if it's not bolstered in some degree by um, by what we're by what we do with that, or how it affects the unconscious narrative. It's one thing to talk about things consciously. If it doesn't register unconsciously, if it doesn't move the narrative or move the needle in any way, then it's just talk. It's just it, 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 potentially it's just hot air, or you're talking. It's like you're talking to yourself or talking to a wall, or yeah. And again, there's nothing wrong with thought experiments and things like that, but the question is, how, how does this shape ideas? Okay, so when we talk about mythologies of the feminine, um, and when I say mythologies, um, I mean, obviously, there's all the mythological stories and figures that we talk about on Katonia podcast. Oh, and that's the other thing this week, um, the new podcast that's coming out Monday is going to be on Noriona, which is from Japanese folklore. She is a figure who has the head of a woman in a body of the snake of a snake and has this um, kind of she has, she has certain characteristics that are very much like uh, certain water fairies um, in a very dangerous way. So um, that's what our podcast is going to be on for next week. And that's going to be recorded probably tomorrow. I'll record that. 
um, and then do, do the editing in the video over the course of the weekend. But, um, but the thing about, about feminine mythology is that it is, if we talk about the way, okay, if we think about the constructs of relationship. Now, first of all, it's important for me to note up front, because a lot of times when I talk about relationship, when I'm talking about love relationship, I end up talking about man-woman relationship, right? And recognizing that there's way more than just man-woman relationships now. Um, you know, obviously there's, you know, um, there's uh, homosexual relationships where you have, you know, men and men, women and women. Uh, you certainly have trans people um, in relationships uh, in, in different, you know, in different things. You have people who are gender fluid. Um, you have people who are, you know, they're not, um, you know, who are bisexual. I mean, you have, you have all kinds of possibilities for what relationship is. So when we talk about male and femaleness in relationship, what we are talking about is archetypal qualities. We're not talking, and those, and those qualities, by the way, are unknown. The idea that we can ever know an archetype, I think I talked about this when I was talking about the Kali Jordan Peterson thing. You cannot know what an archetype is. Um, it's a term that's, that's bandied about in a lot of ways. That, I mean, there's the idea of the literary archetype, which is a bit different from the, um, from the, from the Jungian idea of the archetype. And also there's the idea of what a lot of times what people try to, to paint as an archetype is really more of a stereotype um, or more of a, a trait or a set of traits that um, when we talk about archetypes, we're talking about ideas. We're talking about like a, and they, it's like a, what they call a constellation of ideas. So if you think about a constellation in the sky as being made up of individual stars, okay, and those stars make a kind of a picture. And that's what we're talking about in a way. I mean, metaphorically speaking, that's what we're talking about with the archetype. It's kind of like these little pinpoints of like these little ideas that kind of come together um, in these, these, these kinds of uh, stories that tend to be part of our collective consciousness. And when they constellate, they constellate at periods of time when, um, we, when, they, when we are able to connect with them in some way, when something in our outer world is connecting with that and can bring them to the fore. The most obvious example I've talked about is falling in love. Okay, when you fall in love with somebody, it's like whatever this concept is of the soul, uh, whether it be anima or animus, okay, depending on you know which way uh, that you know, Jung would say it has to do with your biology, but there may be other ways to uh, to think about that. I've often said that uh, wherever your your attraction lies, this this says something about the nature of the soul archetype or how how it's um, manifesting for you, and 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 it's the form that it will manifest in. It'll it'll end up being a projection that occurs on on the on the person who is beloved, okay. Whether that person's male, female, whatever the 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 dynamic of the relationship is, and it's when you actually fall in love. It's when you feel gripped by a feeling when you're around that person. Uh, where no matter who that person is or what they are or whether they're at actually in a logical sense even good for you, uh, in, in, you know, in terms of, uh, boy, I could have a healthy relationship with this person. Oftentimes, how many times do we pick people who would be unhealthy for us, right? But, but it's not so much about health versus, it, it doesn't matter when you're talking about an archetypal projection. It can be, you know, you, you, and you fall for somebody who is just, whatever they are, somehow something about them captures your soul image and it's something that you you want to move towards it's something that makes you feel creative it's something that makes you feel alive um and it's a feeling we like to be able to stay in but the problem is we often see that person as somehow that, that we think it's about the person and not about what we've projected onto them so when that projection is withdrawn, then we become disappointed in the person, right? Then, oh, now we start to see all their flaws, and now we're not interested in it anymore and stop returning their calls, right? So it's, it's the, you know, when, you, when we hear about those kinds of things happening, and people say, well, how could they be in love one day and not in the next? That's how. <laughs> You've got the archetype. It's in front of you. And archetypes are compelling. They're not something that is... Um, you know, people talk about them very, very casually, like, you know, oh, yeah, kind of manifests this archetype or that archetype. No, it's something that has a, a massive impact on your psyche. It's, 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 and it's, it's so mad. There's even aspects of it that you really just can't even talk about. You just know that it's something you feel in your entire being. They, they're, Jung would have said that they are numinous and autonomous, that they have an autonomy from us. They're not just about 
what we think. They're not something that's in our control. Uh, when they manifest, we, we respond to that. Okay. So when I think about um, dark feminine archetypes, okay, and when, or when I think about relationship archetypes, um, and, we, and these are kinds of the things that we're talking about, particularly uh, when we talk about feminine myth. What are, what are the archetypes around relationships? What narratives are growing out of... Um, what, what narratives grow out of this, um, the, these, these archetypes? What, what, kind of, what kind of stories can grow out of them? Because we can talk, for example, about the mother archetype. We can talk about the father archetype. We can talk about the trickster archetype, right? But what are the stories around these archetypes? How do we see them manifest, not only in myth and folklore, but in literature, um, in film, in different places? Where do we see this, uh, this manifest, right? And, the, and what is the story that it's telling us? That's the thing. And is that a, a necessary way to work with the archetype or deal with the archetype? I mean, is it something inherent in it? We know that the archetypal energy is not something we really have. We don't have, our, our intellect can't control it. Let's put it that way. Our intellect can't control that. But when we become aware of the narratives that are coming up around the archetype, um, where where our mind tries to connect with it or make sense of it or make story. Um, hello, it's good to see you. Um, and yes, so it's, sorry, we just had a, a, just a, for people who are going to be watching this later, <laughs> just kind of randomly, we have a live stream, so, um, so different people popping in. Um, so any case, it's, um, yeah, so, so when we talk about these archetypes around relationship, and for the moment, just for argument's sake, I'm going to talk about man-woman relationships because I'm going to be talking about the archetype that's expressed through Lilith. Okay, now, I know I've talked about Lilith quite a bit recently. We did do the remastered Lilith, and I've posted it. Um, I have other remasters I've got to do, but just it's just the work of going through them in the midst of all this other stuff. I haven't I haven't really sat down to do it yet, but um, but okay. We think about Lilith and we think about the stories around Lilith, okay? And so what is she conceived of? She's sort of this archetype of, she's an anima archetype. She's connected to the archetype of the anima, but she does so in a way that they, the anima manifest is, is often construed in a patriarchal culture as something dangerous, okay? Now we, we realize that anything, and the reason that this is dangerous, okay, if we get back to the whole falling in love concept, is that it takes us outside of our intellect. Uh, we believe, part of the, the patriarchal way of doing things is that our minds can control everything. That if I, if I can think it, I can make it happen. Now, that's not to say that the mind and the intellect and the power of thought doesn't have an influence. It's not that it doesn't have a power, because it does. But we think that that's, that's where we kind of bank all of our, our money, so to speak. That's where we think all of our power comes from, or a lot of people think that. Um, this is why we think about cognitive psychologies where, and, and yet, yeah, over a long period of time, you might be able to change a thinking pattern. But this isn't just all about your conscious thought. This is about what you do knee-jerk and automatically. And that is something that is often recognized um, through art or it's recognized through mechanisms that are not something that touches us in a way. As I've often said about myth, if it, it myth and mythical story and, and art is it, if it, if it really attracts you or it really repels you, then it's saying something about that mythical content. It's, it's some, saying something about how you're interacting with that archetypal content. And when we talk about Lilith, she, she gets portrayed as this demoness, right? People who practice esoteric practices talk about her as being clepotic, right? You know, that she's the partner of Samael, the angel of death, who's also often, often, at least in some versions, construed with the serpent in the garden. Obviously, there's different interpretations of the serpent in the garden, but in the negative sense, in the sense of the, the tempter of Eve or something like that. Um, but the Lilith narrative is is interesting. Lilith ends up being connected to um, the the night owl um, or the screech owl, and um, sometimes it, her name is translated as night hag. But the term Lilith in Hebrew does tend to refer to a screech owl, and uh, I think I've mentioned that I've had one. I actually had a night 
a couple of weeks ago. Now I don't. I know that there are eastern. You know the the, the screech. There are owl. Those owls are around. The I think it is called the eastern screech owl uh, in in the area. And I actually, for the first time, heard one out in the cemetery right outside my house. And I remember thinking, what the heck is that? Because it has a certain type of a call that it does like three calls and then it has this kind of repetitive thing that it does. And I was like, oh, that's got to be a certain bird call. I'm like, but it has to be a nocturnal bird because this was like one o'clock in the morning. And so then I started looking it up and then I, I found it and found it making the call. I'm like, yep, that's a screech owl. Um, so I was like, oh, there's Lilith visiting in the cemetery next door. Um, but, but the Lilith archetype, okay, if, if we think about the story that grows up around this, um, Lilith is independent, okay, and, and we talk a bit about sovereignty. And as I mentioned in this other live stream that I had done, when Lilith is, um, okay, when there's the argument, this is in the, this is in the later um, versions, I think it's in, I want to say it's in the Talmud, uh, of the, the Lilith story from about 200 CE where she is, well, she's the first wife of Adam, and they're both made of the same substance. Now, if we recall, um, when Eve is made, she is made out of the rib of Adam. So there's the implication that woman is somehow an extension of man or comes out of man in some way, which is not the way anything happens in nature, but that's what the mythology is. And these mythologies, you have to understand, they inform the way that we look at things. Um, now, as I've said with Adam and Eve, there's not, it's not necessary that we look at it in the way that we have as like an act of disobedience that brings sin and blah, blah. That I don't think that's a necessary interpretation of that myth. Um, but when we look at Lilith, the argument that she has with Adam is about who gets to be on top. When they want to have sex, who's going to be on top? And she says, why can't I be on top? And he says, well, because I'm the man and I should be on top of you. And she says, well, no, I, I, that's ridiculous. We are, we are of the same substance, okay? They're equals. They're of the same substance. So when she goes and complains to God and then and he says, well, yeah, actually, you should be submissive to him. And she's like, well, and what's funny is that she says the holy name of God and then she disappears. And I'm like, well, she's talking to God, and then she's saying the holy name of God. I don't know. Interesting. This is an interesting thing I, I noticed about that, that text. But oftentimes, the story itself is almost considered to be, um, and I think it also comes, there's also another uh, text that it comes out of, which is one of those more apocryphal texts. Um, and I'm trying to remember what it was called. Um, I can't remember the name of it right now. But there is there is another text, and, and actually, it, it's a text that the, um, that often is considered to be, um, is not, let's just say it's not very well received by the Jewish community because sometimes it's seen to be almost a mockery or a satire in this story. But there's something, and um, there's something in regard to um, this, this kind of idea of where, where, do, where do men and women fit in, okay? Who, where's the equality there? Uh, that that I think fits into this relationship archetype. So when we think about certain qualities that we that we want in relationship, when we try to get into a relationship with people, what's what's one of the big complaints that people have today is that you know you'll hear men say, well, I don't know how to talk to women anymore, right? You know, they, they figured if they couldn't just be saying like you know uh, they, they they weren't saying something to you that that that, that ends up sounding. Um, yeah, like I said, if it's not something that you're welcoming, then it may sound creepy to you. Um, but if, if, if somebody's speaking to you in that way, I, I, I'm reminded, okay, I'm reminded of commercials when I was in, when I was a child, uh, I would grow up and see these commercials on TV. And I remember there was one for, oh, was it like the Crush or Heart Bra or something like that? And it was the woman, like, like she's talking to the camera, presumably to her friend, and she's so excited about this new bra that she bought. And she, you hear this whistling from these men in the background. And she's like, she's just so like, you know, look how sexy and pretty it makes me because all these people are whistling at me. And you look at it now and you're kind of like, um, I, I don't know that that's, that's an effect that I want. You know what I mean? You don't want to see, I, I don't know that if, if I go someplace that, you know, I want people making sexual overtures to me wherever I go. Um, 
which but at the same time then it becomes this whole overture like right now i've got got the got the cleavage and stuff going on here because it's just the way the shirt is but you know it's like if i walked out and people say oh well that's that's not modest you shouldn't look like well why do i have to be modest this is the same society that it gets very angry at muslims for saying oh you make your women cover up and you know put these you know like the ones who wear the um it's not the hijab but the, but the burqa that just covers your whole body right and they just say, well, that's disgraceful. Women are not allowed to show themselves. And I'm like, yeah, but, but this is this is a society. As far as far as this society is concerned, it should be the same way, right? Um, you know, because because if you show if you're showing yourself to people, then you're 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 creating some kind of an invitation. And who says that? Since when? Since when is it an invitation? It's just, you know, yeah, I'm a person, and this is this is the kind of body I have. And oh well, you know, I mean, why why is it why is it necessarily seen that way? But certainly within the way that we have interpreted those narratives, that's the way it is. And so when women say, you know what, no, I, I don't, I don't, you know, I just want to be talked to like a person, not like a thing you're looking at. Then people get very upset. Oh, well, now, you know, you know like the people, people get, it's interesting to see the response in the male community to things like that. Um, and then, of course, you have the extremes in the male community, too. You have like these people who think that they're alpha males and these like Andrew Tate douchebags and people like that who think that they're like, uh, who think that they're like some, there's a big strong man who's going to tell a woman what to do. And I'm just kind of like, yeah, you know, you know, go ahead make my day. Um, it's, uh, I don't, um, but see, but that's just it. That's, 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 the, that's somehow, somehow a woman, um, just saying, no, I want to kind of be independent and, and do my own thing. Or I at least want to have equal stature, which is really more what it is. It's not so much. This is not so much about conquest. This is not about, um, you know, who's going to dominate who. But that's the way it's become. So this gets me back to the topic that came up. There was a discussion of fidelity. And the reason that this came up, because a lot of the readings that I was doing last week for my other channel, um, the, the, the idea of fidelity was coming up a lot. And I mentioned the fact that we were also uh, with this, um, this particular, we had, we had a solar eclipse in, in Libra. And in Libra season, there's a lot of focus on relationship and what it means to be in a relationship. So fidelity becomes a big thing. There's there's a phrase that I was seeing a lot on um, that comes off of TikTok and different places when it comes to um, younger people who are dating. The, the term body count. What's the body count? And a lot of times this is a term that men will apply to women. Now, this is a more recent term, and I'm like, there's a narrative around this. It's a body count, you know? Um, how many kills have you had, right? Um, because this is still the way, even even in a time when um, we're talking more about, you know, more equality for women and, and, and so forth, or relationships that are not just based on a woman having to stand there looking like a helpless whatever, um, with no brain in her head in, in order to um, be attractive to a man. Um, even as we're moving past that kind of idea, um, we're, we're not, I don't know that we're necessarily getting away from the narrative. Um, now, fidelity is something that we consider to be a good thing in a relationship. When you make a commitment to somebody to be faithful, then you want to be faithful, right? That's, that's the thing. Um, what unfortunately tends to happen a lot, and, and I guess, I guess I should be clear that I've heard also many cases where this can happen the other way as well. It, it can happen either way. But if you're talking about a man-woman relationship, there's a lot of times where, and I've been in relationships like this, where the expectation is that I'm going to be, I'm going to exhibit fidelity. You know, I'm going to be faithful to this partner. But the partner doesn't have to also exhibit the same thing. It's like, for me, it's like a life or death. You know, you have to be faithful. It's kind of like the old thing of you have to be a virgin, right? Um... You have to be faithful. Um, and again, if, if, you, if you're if you in a relationship with somebody and you want to be with them and you've promised it, then of course, you know, yeah, fidelity. Yeah, I, I would I would want that too. I would not want a partner who claims to be faithful and then is out with all these other, other women. Uh, there, there's a lot of reasons why you don't, don't necessarily want that to be the case. Um, but we also live in a culture now that's a bit more commitment phobic. Uh, you'll, you'll hear a lot about hookups and about things like that, but you don't see people necessarily getting together in the same way. And it's because our constructs around love and around fidelity and around these kinds of things, they're very conditional for one thing. One thing we have not gotten out of 
is the idea of a relationship where, you know, love tends to be conditional. And that is because the way this patriarchal dynamic has been, where it's like, okay, well, then you're supposed to be the one on the bottom getting down to the Lilith idea. And women are going, uh, no, never mind. I'm not going to choose that. I'm going to choose something else. And so they tend to look at all men with kind of a jaundiced kind of stink eye, like, you know, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not getting myself involved in that. And, but, but it's not, but, you know, it, it's not necessary. And but then even, even within, okay, even within relationships where there's marriages and things, you will frequently have people who feel like they are um, suffocating or, or, or oppressed or, or that there's something going on. And hello, Jenny. Um, so we, we tend to have this feeling like that, that in the relationship that we are, um, I don't know, there, there's something about monogamous relationships. If we expect it to be like it was when we first met, like when people have that first flush of love, which as I mentioned, that's the archetype projection that doesn't really last. If you are, um, if you are in that space, then it, it with, then, then you, then, you know, if you expect that that's what your relationship's going to be, uh, you tend to be disappointed because again, it's one of those things that kind of, it kind of flits in and out. You don't necessarily want to be in that kind of position all the time because the soul projection um, is more about, it is, it is, it, it can be the mechanism as Jung has said for us to come together, but it isn't always, it, it tends to be a more judgmental kind of, of thing. The anima can be the source of your creativity. It can be a wonderful thing, but if somebody becomes too obsessed with the anima, then it can become a negative thing. Similarly, a woman can, or you know, whoever's attracted to men can be interested in, in, in an anonymous figure, but the anonymous often manifests as something very judgy. Um, you see the anonymous in action when you have, um, I, I worked in libraries for years, so when you have the groups of women who sit around and go, oh, did you look at her? Did you see what she's wearing? Da, da, da. And you know, they say one thing to your face and then they, they stab you in the back. That's the anonymous in action, usually a negative anonymous uh, in women because it becomes a competition. It becomes a, you know, who's the best looking, who's the thinnest, who's this, who's that, you know, who's, who's the, you know, and, and it, and it, it's just, it's, it's an interestingly ridiculous thing that we tend to do as human beings, but, but it is a thing that, that happens. And the question is though, okay, so if we want to look at that whole idea, and if we want to look at the idea of fidelity, if we want to think about um, this as being a, a key component of relationships, and again, I'm a person who's in favor of fidelity. If I'm if I if I'm going to be, make a commitment to somebody, then you've made a commitment, you know. Otherwise, don't make the commitment. <laughs> you know? just, just don't do it. If you're not going to keep it, don't do it. All right. And I think I think some of the problem with this is that not only you know we're talking about this mythology of submission, but also having good things around ownership and property. Our ideas around purity tend to connect with that as well because it's the idea of, um, you know, something, something that is brand new and untouched. Um, I found, you always, know, there was somebody, I, I saw on one of these news, women's news things that I, that I follow on my other page about a guy who actually wrote in and complaining about women who had, you know, if, if I marry a woman who's had sex before, or I'm involved with a woman who's had sex with another man, it's like, if I buy a brand new car, I don't expect it to have X number of miles on it. And I'm like, there, there's the problem right there. You're viewing the woman as an object. She's an object. She's a thing to you. She's, um, she's a possession that you acquire. It's back in the days of like, you're paying a dowry for somebody or something. Um, is, is that the way that we want to come into relationship? I mean, yes, it's understood that marriage and things like that traditionally come out of these uh, these contracts. You know, you want to uh, improve the family line in some way. A lot of this has to do with lineage and the way in which we, we gain immortality, as I've mentioned. One gains immortality by continuing the family line, but we don't really tend to see it that way now. And that's not really the point of relationship. So there's a mythology that has to be reworked. What is relationship about? What is it for? Why are we, why do we get married? Why do we, I mean, okay, there's some people who still get married because they want to have family and kids. There's a lot of people also who get married who don't have families and kids or, or in long-term partnerships or whatever. Why is that? There's, that's not the necessary conclusion to it. And you, that's, that's another reason why you don't even want to, to fall into a great mother mythology because then it suggests that the ultimate purpose of woman is to be a container for children. And again, 
we we have the moving parts. For many of us, they work. For some people, maybe not. They don't work as well. Um, and there can be other health considerations, or people just aren't drawn to it. We have this attitude. It's interesting if you actually had to go for, let's just say somebody from a young age decided they didn't want to have children and they went to a doctor and said, nope, I want to be sterilized. I don't want to have children. Uh, they would be told flat out, no, we, we won't do it. And um, because you, you don't have the choice, because they say, no, you're going to change your mind later. Because the assumption is that that is something women always want. We always want to have, and, and that just isn't true. Um, not everybody does. And in this day and age, especially because, especially because it becomes then the woman's entire life becomes, she, the child is kind of ends up being an extension of her and that becomes what her role, whatever, whoever she is has to take a back seat to that role. Now, some people are fine with that. Some people like to, will choose that and say, yes, I want to have children and I want it. And, and that's great. But, and in, in, a, in, a, in a good relationship, you should be able to um, have a partner, have children, and still be able to be you. Like it should be, it should be something where um, there's kind of a this, this interconnection here that that works for everybody. You know, where everybody is treated with that kind of um, respect. That the roles are to a certain degree uh, supportive of each other. Uh, but frequently that's not what happens. A lot of times you'll hear about like there'll be the birth and then it becomes like, okay, well, the woman, she's the one, it's, it's her job to take care of the baby. Um, it's your job to be the nurturer. You know, somebody comes over to me and wants to hand me their, their child, hand me their child. I'm like, no, don't, you know, don't, don't hand me your child. <laughs> I don't want to be responsible for holding your child. Um, I mean, if they were my own like nieces, grand nieces or something, that would be a different story. But yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't have it. You want to hand me your cat? Sure. I mean, yeah, that, that's great. You know, yeah, I'll, I'll hold your kitty for you. Um, but, you know, or, you know, or even, or even pet your dog, but, you know, but I don't necessarily, um, I don't know. I just don't feel the inclination. And there's some people who think that that's just a really, really horrible thing because, because again, it gets down to what is your role? Who are you? And, um, and fidelity uh, yeah, if you make a commitment, if you both say, hey, we're in this relationship, we're in it together, and that usually means taking the rough with the smooth, there's there's reasons to do that. There's reasons to get involved in that kind of a relationship. Um, because a lot of times we, we want to go through life with a partner. And Jung would say in the most ideal of relationships that you, you kind of reflect off of each other. So whatever your strengths are, it's like if your, part, you know, your, your partner can learn from your strengths you know, and, and I've heard of I've heard of relationships where the one person will say, I'm strong on this and he's not, but he's strong on this and I'm not. And so then it becomes, okay, well, the two of you actually can help develop the areas where you're you're not strong. That that projection factor works well because then it's kind of like you work together and not only can you help support each other in areas where one may might not be as strong, but this is also an a, a, an opportunity for you to um, perhaps develop this in yourself because if we become whole people, then we want to develop all aspects of ourselves, right? And that's that's what the what Jung would call the syzygy. This is the way in which a, a relationship should integrate us, but frequently it doesn't. So okay, so um, when it comes to concepts of fidelity, I think as I mentioned in the other live stream that I did, um, oh, hello Kelsey. Um, the other things when I when I mentioned. Um, other um, other ideas about fidelity. Um, I've said that when there becomes a concern about fidelity, there's usually one of two reasons that this happens. One reason is that you might have somebody who has been burned by an unfaithful partner. They could have been very much in love and then either their partner um, left them for somebody else or their partner um, just decided, uh, or, or, you know, or, or they just, they were in love with somebody and then that person gradually, um, fell out of love with them and then eventually got together with somebody else. You know, there's that broken heartedness, you know, that you chose me and then you betrayed me and chose somebody else, right? Uh, or the woman who has guy friends and then she runs off with one of her guy friends or something, you know, uh, that, that can make somebody, um, worried about fidelity. I think I was mentioning that I had some guy friends who I just knew just from going to concerts and stuff. I mean, they were not people I was romantically involved with or even interested in. 
But some of them actually stopped talking to me when they got married because their spouses were, had been burned so badly in previous relationships that they could not bear the idea that their husband had a friendship with any other female. Now, this is an unfortunate thing because we live in a world that's filled with men and women and we can't just say, oh, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm female, so I can only be friends with women. Um, you know, we, you know, you, you can have friends, you know, from, from wherever, you know, and we, we have friends from all walks of life. Just because we are friendly with somebody of the opposite sex doesn't mean we're involved with them. But it's very interesting how many people seem to think that that's a thing. If I have male friends who I hang out with or we meet for dinner once in a while and stuff, and they'll be like, oh, you met for dinner. It's like, no, there's nothing going on there. We're just friends. You know, it's like, like, no, they're, they're not looking at me that way. And I'm not looking at them that way. It's just completely not what's happening. We're just, we're just buddies, you know, from, from whatever, whatever background we, we have together. Um, and we like to get together and we like to talk and we have, a, you know, a couple of pints and, and shoot the breeze, you know, it's. Because it's interesting, because I, that, that, I think society pushes that upon us, too. Yeah, and, you know, it's interesting. When you think about starting from uh, from childhood, um, when you've been on the school bus, and if somebody, like, the boy comes up and keeps pulling your hair, and you complain about it, they go, oh, he just does that because he likes you, you know? Uh, or somebody just comes up to you and, and touches you, or, you know, or you're, like, in this, like, of a, like a first grader, and someone randomly comes up and kisses you, Right. And people are like, oh, you know, that's just cute. It, it teaches, it's interesting. I was, I was talking to um, my sister about my, one of my grandnieces. One of my grandnieces is now getting to a point where she's a little person with a personality. She's only two years old, but she's, um, she's, 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 she's very smart and very, um, she's all Aries, like I said. She's Aries sun, Aries moon, Aries ascendant. She's like all Aries, this child. And, um... But um, one of the things my sister said was that my um, my nephew and niece-in-law, um, their their whole thing with her is that um, like if if the family member comes over and wants to pick her up or hug her or kiss her, they said it's her choice whether she wants to be touched. It's her choice. Um, if she's because she's kind of like this and doesn't want to touch somebody, that's that's her prerogative. She's not. They don't. They said we don't want her to feel. Like, you know, oh, you know, go on and give grandma a kiss. You know, like she's not, they're not um, into that. And my sister said, you know what? She says, I'm fine with that. She's like, you know, the, she, she needs to make the decisions about who she wants to be closely connected with. And that should not be imposed on her. Uh, you know, so it's so, but that's the thing. But, but we, but yeah, that's kind of it. We're kind of raised from a young age, especially women. When, when there's a boy or somebody who makes us uncomfortable, it's just like, oh, it's just because he's flirting with you. Oh, it's just this. And, and that, that can get to consequences that are, that are not, um, you know, it, it, it's not a kind of a situation. First of all, it's a situation that makes you tell you that your boundaries are invalid. And secondly, it can sometimes lead to situations of extreme distrust. Especially if, um, you know, especially if you have situations where, you know, um, in a worst case scenario, where that um, that violation of boundaries becomes something other than just you know auntie wanting to give you a you know give you a kiss on the cheek you know, um, or or an uncle or or somebody you know it, it can it can move into a space that is not um, not particularly um, that can be problematic um, in a lot of ways, and so. Right. So when we get raised with this idea of fidelity, I think a lot of times we grow up in our teen years, women especially, when they when they, they get a boyfriend or they, they're dating somebody, there's this attitude of, I, I used to used to hear, hear this a lot from like 13 and 14 year olds, oh, he's going to be my husband and we're going to be together forever. And you're kind of like, yeah, right. <laughs> you're 13, like you haven't, you haven't even lived yet. Um, and, and actually, um, you would not want that to be the case at all. I mean, that's not, uh, that, that's far too young in an age to, to be trying to make that decision. Never mind the, all, you know, all, all of the, all the, the problems with that. You haven't even, you know, you, you're, you're ending your life before you've started it because you, you've just, you've made a decision like that, that you probably shouldn't make until you have a better, um, grasp on what relationships are, you know, um, but it's understood that when you have that that soul projection that you see somebody and you think, oh, that's the person and I can't live without them. Well, the reality is that, yes, you can and you will <laughs> um, eventually. But when people were burned enough times, I'm kind of going around circles here, but the, the kind of the, the when um, 
When someone's burned enough times, that can make somebody very concerned about fidelity. They don't want a partner who's going to be um, running around with uh, a lot of other people. Um, now, there's another time then when fidelity becomes, yeah, yeah. And there's another thing that can come up, and that is when, um, and, I, and I've seen this happen too for people, when they are in a relationship with somebody and, um, I, I, okay, I, I've seen this happen with certain female friends where, let's just say I'm out with a female friend and we, we stop for coffee after work or something like that. Or, or even I'm going out to lunch, and then that person's husband is constantly texting, where are you and who are you with? Now, mind you, it's not that this is a person who would cheat on their partner at all. I mean, they have a family, kids, you know, everything, and you're like, okay. And this person just kept doing that. I want picture. I want to see, I want you to show on video who you're with. Like, to the point where it's like, I, I don't trust you to go out anywhere because I assume you're going to be out with somebody else. And that is always the red flag that tells you... Um, like when that started happening with this friend, I said, oh, her partner's cheating on her um, because then it becomes projected onto the partner. You know, they start, you know, it's almost like it's like a gaslighting. You're accusing the partner of being the unfaithful one when in fact that's the person who's being unfaithful. It could be a guilt response, too. But whatever it is, you know, we get this thing around fidelity and fidelity gets to this idea of ownership. OK, and um and it's a tough one because on the one hand, yeah, if you make a commitment, it's kind of like you you belong to each other, so to speak, right? But when you get into um, this idea, um, I, I I remember being uh, talking to some friends where people would get married and then all of a sudden the husband, it's just kind of like, okay, wants to lock the wife in the house and she can't go anywhere. You know, when it becomes like that, it was like the, the podcast I did on the Dier Dua. You know, there was the beautiful woman who gets married to this much older man just because he had the money and she couldn't marry the man that she loved. And he, of course, kept her like she was a possession. He would trot her out like a possession. He would abuse her and then he would lock her up in this room, you know, and she eventually regained her sovereignty by starving herself to death. And then she turned into a vampire and killed him and killed the father who actually did it, you know, because um, we've talked a lot about sovereignty around this. Um, and fidelity without sovereignty doesn't doesn't work. I mean, it, it really, you have to revision it in a way that, that that works together. Not that one partner is necessarily submissive to the other, but that you have a dynamic where both people want to be in this relationship. They they want to be with each other. They're not inclined to go find somebody else. You know, even if even if their their eye is caught by something something shiny. Um, that they that they don't. I mean, that's that's not that's not a consideration. That that's not something that happens. And of course, that requires unconditional love. It requires respect, and it requires trust. And that's not something a lot of people are willing to give, um, based on the way the current mythology is, the way the current dynamic is, the dynamic that says I have to be on the bottom. And then and, and and then Lilith asks the question, Why do I have to be on the bottom? Why? Why are we not equals? And, and I don't know why that's a question, that that's an arrogant question. It's almost portrayed as though, how dare she? What do you mean, how dare she? Um, they're, uh, Lilith and Adam were created equal. Why, why does he get, what, 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 um, what is it about him that allows him to dominate her? What's the, what's the, um, what's the rationale for that? What's, what's the, um, the reason behind it? There isn't one. There isn't one. Um, and that becomes a lot of the problem. It becomes that when you get into two relationships, um, the wife is there to be like the maid, the cook, you know, the the sex partner when you when you want it. Um, and then, but if but if she has a life where she feels like she's just trapped in this and she doesn't have her own sovereignty, she can't be her own person, can't do her own thing, then it's a relationship that's not. It, it's going to be. It's going to run into trouble. It's not going to work. Uh, the woman always becomes the monster when she loses her sovereignty. And I think the example that I pointed to in that other podcast had to do with the stories of, um, of Dame Ragnell and of the, the loathly lady, the, 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 the you know, dis disgusting old hag who lives in the forest, right? Um, and she's the one who approaches King Arthur when King Arthur's life is in danger because he encounters the, um, the, the green knight who says to him with a green this 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 um this, you know this 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 giant ogre of a man um and who says to him um who's going to kill him for for hunting in his territory 
And when Arthur kind of manages to talk him down, he says, okay, you know what, come back in a year. And if you can tell me, answer the question, what is it that women want? I'll spare your life. Okay. Now I did do a podcast on this one. I think, oh gosh, was it January, 2021, 22? Can't remember. It was been a while, but I did, I did this podcast a long time ago on Dame Ragnell. And, um, so Dame Ragnell, uh, King Arthur is trying to find this answer. Uh, she approaches him and she's, she's again, she's this, this, this kind of slob slobbering old hag. And she goes, uh, she goes, I know the answer to your question. She says, but um, I'll give you the answer, but there's a price. I want to be married to the most handsome knight. And I, I can't remember. I always, I always, I said this every time and I never go back and look this up. Is it Galahad or is it Gawain? I want to say it's Galahad. And uh, she wants, she wants him for a husband. And so Arthur's like, great. Yeah, if you can give me the answer, no problem. But of course, he hasn't really discussed this with Galahad. So he talks to him and says, uh, I kind of promised you in marriage to this, uh, you know. And Galahad says, well, Galahad says, well, you're my, you know, I, I'm, you know, you're my king. And, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm obedient and I will do what you ask me to do. And so, you know, so he agrees to go ahead with the marriage. And so he's married to her and everybody sees this woman and they're just horrified that he's marrying this, this woman. Um, but he's like, well, you know, this is, this is, this is, the, this is the price of my king staying alive. So this is what I'm going to do. And so then he takes her to, you know, he kind of dog, he kind of tries to really take his time, but then they go to the conjugal bedroom to, uh, to consummate the union. And, uh, he's thinking, oh gosh, but he's like, well, he's like, nope, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to do what's required of me. You know, he's going to toughen up to me do what's required of me. So he gets into bed with her and he gives her a kiss and shockingly she turns into this absolutely gorgeous woman. And he's just like, whoa, you know, what, what, what's this? And she says to him, she says, yeah, I've been, I've been under a curse. She said, um, and, uh, she says, and since you were able to look past the way I, I look and you were still able to show me that love and respect, then now you're seeing this beautiful woman. And she says, well, she says, now here's the thing. She says, I can be beautiful with you in the bedroom and ugly when you're out in public, or I can be beautiful with you out in public and I can be ugly in the bedroom. Now, which way would you like it? And he thinks, he says to her, he says, well, you know what, lady, this is your life. This should be your choice. And she's kind of, she, she makes a comment. And like I said, Martin Shaw does this way better than I do, but it had to do with, um, Sovereignty given, sovereignty received, and sovereignty returned, something to that effect. And she said, that is what women want, is they want their own sovereignty. And from that moment forward, she was beautiful with him all the time. And that's really what it comes down to. If we think about this also in terms of, if you work at a job, okay, and you have a manager, if that manager micromanages you, stands over you all the time, uh, second guesses you, takes your I takes credit for your ideas, um, is uh, nickel and dimes you for everything or wants to ding you on your performance evaluation because, oh, I feel like you went to the bathroom too many times and stuff. You know, you're, you're going to become rather hateful towards that person. And if you don't quit that job, you're going to, you know, this is where people go the kind of, um, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, quiet quitting, as they call it, where they kind of sit at work and they're like, yeah, I'm here and I'm not, I'm not doing squat for you. You know, I'm not doing anything. Um, you know, people might do it in a very passive aggressive way, but they're, they're going to make it that, you know, they're not, that they're not, that's not, that's not a tactic to make anybody care about your business or doing things. Even if they end up doing their job, they're going to do the bare minimum. And, uh, sometimes you can get people who might even try to sabotage, right? If you have a boss who um, who recognizes, who just says, you know, hey, um, I'm, I'm not going to stand over you. I respect you. I respect your intelligence and your ability to do this, and I will be here to support you, but I'm not going to stand over you like you're an idiot and don't know how to do your job. And, oh, you need some flexibility on things? Sure, I can be flexible. Now, that's a kind of a boss that you're going to do work for. That's the kind of a boss where you're going to feel like, okay, we're in this together and I'm happy to contribute, uh, not only for my own benefit, but because I'm happy to be part of a group that respects me and respects that I, I have a brain and I can do this, right? It's a similar concept here. It's the idea if you're in a marriage and you basically say like, okay, I've married you and now you're, I'm like the teenager and you're like mom and I don't have to 
interact with you unless I want something from you. Um, you don't build a relationship that way. Uh, so when it comes to fidelity, fidelity has to come, the idea of faithfulness comes with independence. It seems like a paradox, but it's really not. Those two things go together. If you allow your partner to be who they are and you love and respect them for who they are, not who you want them to be, not when they look a certain way, not when, um, you know, it did not when they're just following what, what you think they should be or should be doing or what their role should be. Um, and, and not abdicate and recognizing that you're in a partnership. It's not like, oh, okay, we're married now. So she's going to take away all things in life that I don't want to take care of. And she's just going to make, you know, magically wave her wand and fix it and make it go away. Um, you don't, you don't gain that. Or, or if she has emotional needs and wants to talk and you say, you know, and you have, I mean, I, I, I was in a marriage like this where it's like, I don't want to, you know, don't talk to me, leave me alone. Stop bothering me with your crap. You know, in other words, you know, I'm not interested in your voice. I'm not interested in your feelings. I'm only interested in my own. Okay. Well, you know what? You're you, okay. That's how you are, but you're not going to build a relationship that way. It doesn't happen. So yeah. So to the point about fidelity, the idea of fidelity has to be detached from the idea of property. Okay. Fidelity is gained through, uh, through trust, through respect, and through recognizing the sovereignty of each other. And it goes the other way too. It shouldn't be a woman, like women who get married and say, oh, I'm gonna change him. No, you're not, he's not, he's not a child. Well, he shouldn't be. Um, you know, this is not about you know, changing diapers and stuff, right? I mean, you're not gonna change this guy. You're not gonna, and, and they're not gonna change you. It's not, um, ma marriage does weirdly kind of throw a switch sometimes. We, we sometimes can, if we're very unconscious, we can default into this mother-father archetype thing. You get out of the anonymous dynamic and you get into the mom, you know, mother-father. And that, that can be a problem too, because then if, if they get married and the man now sees the woman as mom, then she starts taking on the role of mom. And then he's no longer interested in her as, as a partner in that way, because she's just now, now she's just like mom. So she's not as interesting, right? And this, this is where all the problems are, but this is why we say that these kind of patriarchal ideas about what it means to be in relationship, because relationship is archetypally a very feminine thing. The idea of working together rather than being on your own or doing things independently. You need the masculine aspect of independence, but you need it to be um, working in a, in a scenario where people work together, okay? Where it's like you're two independent people working together, okay? You're, it's not that, um, now I somehow have to um, morph into some extension of you um, because now we're getting back to, you know, to Adam's rib, right? I mean, it, you're not an extension of this person. That's not, that's not how it works. It's kind of like, you know, it's like, no, if, if, if we're equal, then we should be equal. It's not just like, this is your role and this is my role. And, um, you know, as the man, I, I can be the independent one and I can do what I want. But you, as the woman, know this is this is what you're this is what's expected of you. And people, no matter what they say intellectually, they get into marriages and they fall into that unconsciously. And women can do it too, depending on what their relationships are like with their fathers or what or with their mothers. Um, can respond to men in a way too that that can also be problematic. There so. Point being, because now we're getting towards 103, and so now I'm getting towards the end of this this live stream. But I say I talk about fidelity in terms of feminine myth, because the myth is that so the, so the myths of fidelity should not be about um, no matter how poorly you treat me, I have to be faithful to you. Okay, because that's that's another that's another possibility. Like divorce is bad, right? No matter how bad you are, you know, I'm, you know, you have to be faithful. Um. It should be more about how do you come together in that respect and trust and how, you know, again, going back to you care about this person no matter how they look. Um, you know, if they change, if they if they, they did one kind of a thing and now, now I want to move on and I want to do something different. Well, it's not like, oh, well, I only liked you when you were this way before and I'm not interested in you now. Um, then that's not, that's a situation. If, if that's what you, if you think there's going to be conditions, then that's why, then you shouldn't 
be in a marriage relationship, right? This is there you shouldn't there shouldn't be conditions placed upon it. And this marriage should not be a trap for both people. Both people should be free. So the way we need to look at these mythologies is how do they point to the way in which um, you know, the, the woman is beautiful for you when she is sovereign. If the woman, if you treat the woman poorly, uh, or you treat her like she's an object, or like she's just there to be your servant or your personal slave or something, then she turns ugly. And um, so, yeah, so there's, so these are ideas that are coming up in the culture. The thing about Me Too culture and empowerment culture, while I think it's good to stand up and say, hey, look, I don't want to be treated this way. Um, the problem with it, though, can be that then it becomes all men are, are demonized. You know, men, and, and the thing is, the reason men frequently still behave in the same patterns is because they've not been taught any way to be different emotionally. They're raised with their own set of um, patriarchal ideas about you know, emotions are for weak people. And, uh, you know, you know, we, we don't get, you know, the intimacy is just for, you know, uh, just for the fun of the act and not necessarily for anything else. You know, it becomes, they kind of get, they can fall into some of these own, their own narratives about manhood and what it means to be a man and um, what, what is expected of them as a partner uh, that are also false. So, um, yeah. So anyway, I just felt like this was a good example when this, this topic had come up. If we're talking about relationship, relationship should not be a conquest, okay? Uh, we but it's frequently talked about that way. It should not be a conquest. Um, understanding that the anima animus thing can be a little bit like a game. That's, if you're talking about a long-term relationship, that's ultimately not where it's at, okay? And... It's not a conquest and your the woman is not your property. That's the thing. It, understand that some of these ways of thinking, the woman is treated like she's your property. Like now she's your indentured servant who's there to do whatever for you. And if that's the way, and I'm not saying everybody necessarily is like that or all marriages are like that. But if that's the way you look at your partner, then that's something that you need to re-examine because that is not... You don't build successful relationships. And, and just because people stay together doesn't mean they're successful relationships. People can stay for years in unhappy situations because they, they think that that's fidelity. But it's not. Fidelity is involves unconditional love. It involves respect and trust. And it involves sovereignty above all. You, the, you know, the, the relationships where um, you, know, you're, you're, you, you treat each other as sovereign, okay, it's not the old ball and chain, right? You're not, where each person is sovereign, those relationships have a certainly a much better chance of working because they're built on the right things. They're not built on the idea, idea of, I married you to do the laundry and, um, you know, to just be around when, you know, like when I, when I want sex or whatever. Um, it, it, that's what the marriage is based on. In the meantime, I'm gonna go hang out with my friends and leave all the life responsibilities to you. If that's what you're, it, it, that, it, it ain't going to work. It's not, it's not a relationship. And, um, and, and women should not necessarily accept that as that role. And men should not have to accept that, uh, they think that they're unmanly in any way by, by engaging and trying to have a real relationship with their partner. There's nothing unmanly about it. Um, you know, it's, it's to me being manly is somebody who can, can negotiate femininity in a way that's, that is respectful and healthy. If you treat femininity like something you have to tamp down in its place, then, then you're threatened by it, you know, <laughs> then you're threatened by it. And, um, you know, that's something uh, that needs to be thought about. So anyway, uh, thank you guys for joining me today. I hope this was, um, was interesting. Um, again, as I'm going to mention, this took the study of feminine myth. Um, we have started the semester, but if people still want to audit individual lectures or just purchase the recordings of individual lectures, all of that is on the registration slash recordings page at the Institute for Feminine Myth.org. So anybody's welcome to join us. Awesome, thank you, and thank you, look great, blessings tenfold. Oh, thank you so much. Very much appreciate that, and thank you, and, and thank you guys for joining me. Really happy that you could join me today. Happy that I was able to fit this in this week and do this uh, do this live stream. Thank you for this, so and so. Oh, thank you very much, I really appreciate that. 
And um, yeah, so I will, and I will try to get all the recordings up. I, I gotta hurry up and get recordings up. Patreon po- um, special edition coming up today, and then there'll be a new podcast on Monday. So thank you guys so much for joining me. I hope you have a great rest of your week, and I will hopefully be back on Monday. So take care. <laughs>